me take a breath here. What an incredible afternoon. What a truly incredible afternoon. I am so honored and so excited to be here in front of you. And I would like to borrow something that Genesis said. Your presence, my colleagues' presence, the students' presence, and those who are here liberate all of us. So thank you for staying. Thank you for being here. I hope I continue to liberate you by talking a little bit about my passion, my call to ocean adventure. I am a marine scientist and have been for three decades. Hard to imagine, really, at this point. Um, but I have a privilege because of those three decades. I can ask a little twisting question. I can ask about how I find a meaning, a life of meaning in those three decades of all the work I've done in the oceans. And it's easy for me to talk about scuba diving on coral reefs, climbing on board commercial trawlers. It's harder to talk about finding a life of meaning. So what a good academic does, a good researcher does, is she goes to her silent advisors, my books. I have lots of them piled up all over my house. And I found a little treasure, and that treasure is this book, called The Monk and the Philosopher. And the subtitle's key. A father and son discuss the meaning of life. Yes, yes, I can find gems in this book to help me. And this is not just any father and son. The father, Jean-Francois Revel, is a philosopher. His son, Mathieu Ricard, is a Buddhist monk, but not just any Buddhist monk. Mathieu Ricard, for 26 years, was training to be a molecular biologist, a scientist, under a very famous scientist called Jacques Monod, the father of genetic switches, that changed our whole understanding of genetic expression in developmental biology and beyond. Then at the age of 26, Mathieu Ricard left science to study Buddhist spirituality after publishing his PhD and papers to go study with the lamas in Tibet. And the opening line of this book is his father, the philosopher, asking, why did you leave science and become a Buddhist monk? And I was curious too. Matthew Ricard answers, my scientific career was the result of a passion for discovery. And boy, does that resonate with me right through the core because that's exactly why I went into science. But then he followed up with, science wasn't enough to give meaning to my life. Dedicating my whole life to it was something I could no longer envisage. So at 26, Matthew Ricard could no longer envisage himself as a scientist, but he could envisage himself as a Buddhist monk. Now, don't, don't worry. I'm not about to go to Tibet to become a Buddhist monk. Although I must admit the air quality might be better. And on top of that, I don't have to answer as many emails. Hmm, it's possible. But because, unlike Matthew Ricard, from the age of three, I wanted to be a scientist. It was in my blood. From the age of three years old, yes, that is me on the tricycle, my sturdy steed, and that cutesy little dress, sailor dress I was wearing, but I am looking out to the Pacific Ocean, the largest and deepest ocean in the world. And I was saying, I wonder what's out there. I wanted to be an explorer, an ocean explorer. I saw myself as that 28-year-old scuba diver. I also saw a vast sea infinite of fish and water. And that is what I wanted to explore, the unknown. So, at the age of three, I saw myself as that scuba diver. 
And that gave me the first little clue to helping me find that meaning in life. How do you see yourself? And, and, and it's a gift. How do you see yourself? It's a good question to ask. However, at the age of 12, as mothers tend to do, at, they, she asked me, my mother asked me, what would you like to do, Kishleinem, when you grow up? She is Hungarian. So it has that beautiful Zsa, Zsa Gabor voice. And I said, I want to be a scientist. I want to be an ocean explorer. She said, no, 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 no. Science is a difficult, difficult pursuit. Why would you want such a difficult life? You will be, you will end up in a dirty lab coat in a dingy laboratory. You will be ugly. <laughs> no one will want to marry you. Why would you want that? So my mother envisaged in her eye something like that poor guy in the middle. But that's not me. That was me in the scuba suit. So I said, thank you to mom. And I said, you know, Kristen Sapen, mother. And went on to graduate school in oceanography in Barbados. Actually, at McGill University, McGill, uh, because I was born in Victoria, British Columbia, I should say, I'm Canadian, and McGill owns a tropical research institute called Bel Airs in Barbados. And that's me on a stool looking down a microscope. And when I went to Barbados, I didn't realize that I would stumble upon my second key question that helped me understand meaning in my life. I want to take you into the day, that day, that very day when I'm looking down the microscope. It's the wet season in Barbados. So I had gone out to the reefs, which were about 150 feet from where I was sitting. It's a fantastic institute. And the bluehead wrasse, which I was studying, a fish, a coral reef fish, had spawned in the middle of the water column, as they do. And I took a, a net, and I swiped the net through the eggs. And I brought it into the lab, put the eggs into a Petri dish, put the Petri dish on the stage of the microscope, and I looked down. And as I looked down, the thunder banged. And the rain started pouring down on the corrugated roof. And nature seemed to echo all around me. The rain almost was in the room itself, as though it was sort of embracing me. And I looked down the ocular onto the plate to see a miracle occur. That miracle was an egg, a single cell, transforming into a swimming twitching, beautiful larval fish. And actually, over 97% of fish produce larvae. That's how they reproduce and move around. And that picture that you're seeing actually was the original. I've carried that picture around with me for 40 years. And I heard a voice inside of me saying, pay attention. This is important. I didn't know why it should be important, but it seemed to be important. Inside me, there was a voice telling me. So this is my second kernel. Who do you listen to? I listened to me at that time. I didn't know why. Then I went back to Canada and continued my graduate education. As a PhD student, uh, studying cod, Atlantic cod, in 1990. In 1990, Canadian, uh, the Can Canada was in a tremendous devastation. The fisheries crisis had taken a fish, Atlantic cod, that had been so plentiful when Giovanni Cab Cabot discovered them. John Cabot discovered North America as well as Atlantic cod. 500 years ago, in 1497, he could take baskets, wicker baskets, dip them over the side of the ship into the surface of the water, hold them up, and they would be brimming with codfish the size of men. 
When I went on board the Lady Hammond, the fisheries trawler you see, we couldn't catch enough to fill one major net in 10 days. And the largest fish we caught was what Walter, he's an intern for Department of Fisheries and Ocean, or was. So that is one of two state cods that we caught. And I wanted to bring your attention to one thing. See, if you, if you look at that fish, the head of her, she's a her, she's about 15 years old, is much too large for her body. She was starving. Because the overfishing disaster in Canada had not only overfished Atlantic cod, but had also decimated their favorite food, capelin, starving the fish. And two years later, Canada announced in July 2nd, I'll never forget that day, an entire cod moratorium, which continues to this day, by the way, on all fishing. 200,000 fishermen were put out of work that very day. Towns were closed. Newfoundland, the poorest province in Canada, was economically devastated. And I made a choice. I took my knowledge of raising fish from eggs, and I decided that I would put away my childish dreams of an infinite ocean and help those fishermen. So that's my sec third corner, third kernel of, that I learned from this book. What choices do you make? I made the choice to take my knowledge and use it. And from eggs and larvae came great new beginnings because along with my colleagues in Newfoundland and in New England, we generated what is now a thriving cod aquaculture industry. And in 2014, 15, Aquaculture fish farming took an enormous leap. Over 50% of fish on your plates in the restaurant, in the grocery store, are farmed. And if they're farmed in Canada, the United States, and Europe and its associated countries, they are healthy to eat. So, about 12 to 13 years ago, I wanted to continue my call to ocean adventure and a life of meaning. And I came here to UNT. And I'm very proud to say I've had a wonderful, wonderful 13 years. I've worked with Mexico uh, farmers as well as Mexico uh, faculty at the University of Mexico in Toluca. Those are my colleagues there you see in the picture. And we helped rainbow trout, truchas, fish farming improve their productivity. We helped 300 families of fish farmers. Here at UNT, we established the UNT Aquaponics Center, and we uh, grew 150 tilapia, and we donated them to the Youth Village in South Dallas for their restaurant. You might have seen the signs on the, on the highway. Finally, um, then we also, I'm also very interested in the oceanic origins of the human gut microbiome to improve human health. So I continue to use my knowledge and adventure to um, explore. So we return to where we started, back to this book, The Monk and the Philosopher, and to the very last line written by the Buddhist monk, Matthew Ricard, who said, experience is the path and as Buddha said, it's up to you to follow it. So keeping with the theme of this conference, follow, find, be, create the change with a few caveats. Follow your call to adventure. Find your meaningful life. Be or create the change you want to see in this world. Thank you, Gandhi not what others want you to be or to create. Sorry, Mom. Thank you.